My previous video discussed the pros and cons of equipping your airplane with a whole airframe ballistic parachute. Now let's talk about the aeronautical decision making associated with ploying the chute. Though I believe in the parachute as a safety device, that doesn't mean I'd always pull it for any engine failure. As I mentioned in the previous video, when I'm flying around the country, I'm always paying attention to the surrounding terrain, asking myself where I could land if I couldn't reach an airport. Sometimes there's plenty of good options and other times not so much. So if there's a perfect wide open field or an actual runway that I'm confident that I'll make, I may not pull the chute. But if there's any question in my mind that I can make the target field, safely land the airplane and get it stopped in time, I'll pull the chute. That still leaves a lot of gray area. So where can a pilot go to find guidance and best practices on whole aircraft ballistic parachutes? The organization with the most experience with this is Cirrus. I'd recommend all pilots of parachute equipped aircraft take the Cirrus CAPS course. It's free, you just have to create a login. I'll put the link in the description. The numbers won't be exactly the same between Cirrus and Sling, but the key takeaways from that course can certainly be adopted by Sling pilots. At my airline, we talk about emergencies being sorted into two buckets, either the time bucket or the no time bucket. In other words, does this threat require immediate action, or do we have time to evaluate, plan, troubleshoot, etc.? Similarly, the CAPS course discusses two paths, pull immediately or consider. The pull immediately category includes scenarios such as mid-air collision, a spin, loss of control, an engine failure between five or 600 feet to 2,000 feet AGL, or an engine failure at any altitude if no survivable alternative exists. For example, shortly after takeoff, rapidly rising terrain, dense trees or structures or buildings. Under the category of consider pulling are scenarios where other possible outcomes might exist or when you have time, such as an engine failure above 2,000 foot AGL. Let's take the most simple scenario, an engine failure at high cruise altitude. In that case, I would initially act as if I didn't have a parachute. In other words, I would do all the same things, do all your engine out, immediate action items, establish the best glide, activate Garmin Smart Glide if you have it installed, turn towards the nearest suitable airport or off airport landing site, troubleshoot for your Rotax pilots out there, EMS backup, pumps, lane switches, change fuel tanks, etc. Then as you glide down, Cirrus suggests making 2,000 foot AGL your decision altitude. If at that decision altitude, you're in a position from which you're sure you can make a safe landing, such as on a runway or a nearly perfect off airport landing site, then maybe you don't need to pull the chute and you can just dead stick it in. If however, at decision altitude, a safe landing is not assured, pull the chute. Some might ask, why go through the trouble of gliding for a field if you've got a chute? Why not just pull the chute immediately, even if you are above a 2,000 foot AGL? Well, as pilots, we should always be thinking about the next what if. It's best if we can come up with our procedures while sitting on the ground at ground speed zero so we have a plan in case of an actual emergency in flight. So we go through these what if thought experiments. What if the engine fails? Okay, I would establish best glide and troubleshoot if I've got time. Well, what if it won't restart? Well, I look for a field and I try to do a dead stick landing. Well, what if it's night or low IFR or I can't find a suitable landing site? Well, then I got the parachute. But the what if doesn't stop there. What if the chute fails to deploy? Yes, that could happen. With the Cirrus, as of year end 2023, there has been 126 documented CAPS saves. Because of that solid track record, you can be fairly confident that pulling the chute will have a successful outcome. While Sling has done the rocket extraction tests and the parachute companies have tested the deployments of their parachutes themselves, to my knowledge, there has yet to be a real life chute deployment in a Sling aircraft in flight. So setting myself up for a dead stick landing leaves me prepared for the next what if, just in case the chute doesn't deploy when I pull it. The parachute, just like every other system in the airplane, is a mechanical device. Even the most well-designed and engineered devices can fail from time to time. Even in the Cirrus, there's been a handful of incidents where the pilot pulled the chute, but it did not deploy. 
One was a loss of control case. A pilot got disoriented in the clouds, tried to pull the chute, but it didn't deploy. The pilot eventually broke out of the clouds with enough altitude that he was able to regain control and land. Another was an engine failure and the pilot pulled the chute around 2,000 foot AGL as he was trained. The chute did not deploy, but fortunately he was over flat desert and he was able to make a successful dead stick landing and survive. This is why you keep flying the airplane until you can't anymore. So in the case of an engine failure, even if I'm over less than favorable terrain and I plan to pull the chute, I will still attempt to set myself up for a successful dead stick landing just in case the chute doesn't deploy. Why 2000 foot AGL for deployment decision altitude? Sears came up with this number because the descent rate under their chute is 1700 feet per minute. So by deploying at 2000 feet, you'll have about a minute under canopy. This gives you time to address your final items, one final mayday call, secure the engine, secure the cabin, tighten your seat belts, and brace yourself for what is sure to be a firm touchdown. With the Magnum chute on the Sling TSI, the descent rate is about 7.2 meters per second, which equals 1,417 feet per minute. So you'll have a little bit more time in the Sling with the Magnum chute. I asked BRS for the descent rate for the parachutes that they provide for the Sling TSI, but I didn't hear back. But I'm sure if you bought one of their parachutes, they'll provide all the necessary documentation. Cirrus has this to say regarding engine failures above 2,000 feet. The pilot must continually evaluate the situation. At 2,000 feet AGL, if the landing is assured, the pilot may continue. If not assured, then activate caps. At 1,000 foot AGL, if the landing is assured, the pilot may continue, recognizing that the risks associated with landing short or an overrun or a low altitude loss of control will likely exceed those of a timely caps deployment. If the landing is not assured by at least the minimum deployment altitude, the pilot should immediately activate caps. That's another reason for the 2,000 feet AGL decision altitude. It gives you time to reassess and change your mind if necessary. At 2,000 feet AGL, you may decide you have a safe landing assured, but then at 1,000 feet AGL, you realize you don't. Then you still have time to deploy. What's the definition of safe landing assured? Well, that's where pilot's judgment comes in. Cirrus suggests that anything other than a runway should be looked at with skepticism. It may be tempting to think a field is as good as a runway, but consider this. If you get injured during a dead stick landing in a field, how long might it take before medical help arrives? If you dead stick it into an airport and run off the end of the runway or get injured, it's more likely that there will be witnesses to call for medical help, and it's more likely that they can easily reach you. In a remote field, there may not be any witnesses, and even if help was called, it may be difficult to reach you in an expeditious manner. So, I would only dead stick it into a field if I was very confident that I could do it without injury. If any doubt, you're probably better off pulling the chute. For a simplified summary, for an engine failure above 2,000 feet AGL, do all the engine out immediate action items, establish the best glide, consider activating Garmin Smart Glide if you have that installed, turn towards the nearest suitable airport or off airport landing site, troubleshoot for sling pilots with Rotax engines, ECU or EMS backup, fuel pumps, lane switches, change fuel tanks, etc. Then at 2,000 feet, if the landing is assured, the pilot may continue, and if not assured, pull the chute. If you think you're landing assured at 2,000 feet, continue and reassess at 1,000 feet. At 1,000 feet AGL, if the landing is still assured, the pilot may continue. If not, pull the chute. For those of you with Garmin G3X, I would suggest having your AGL altitude displayed on your data bar so that you don't have to look up the local elevation and do any math while you're in the middle of an emergency to determine your AGL altitude. Now, for an engine failure below 2,000 feet, that falls more into the no-time bucket. That is, pull the chute immediately. But what is the minimum altitude for chute deployment? The numbers in the CAPS course were for the Cirrus, and that varies by model, but what is it for the Sling TSI? The Sling TSI Pilot Operating Handbook used to mention a number, but now, since you have different options for which chute to install, 
they just refer you to the chute manufacturer's manual. I don't have the numbers for the BRS chute, but for the Stratus Magnum 901, their manual says it's recommended to activate the rescue system at heights greater than 200 meters or 656 feet above the ground. But then it follows that sentence with the following statement. Even at lesser heights, the Magnum rescue system may save your life. There are documented rescues with the Magnum system even from very low altitudes. Further in the manual, it states, in critical situations, activate the rescue system immediately regardless of the flight altitude and terrain over which you are. This is similar to what Cirrus says. While there is a minimum demonstrated deployment altitude, there's no minimum for you to pull. From their CAPS guide, no minimum or maximum altitude for deployment has been set. Whenever a pilot is in a situation in which no other survivable alternative exists, CAPS should be activated regardless of altitude. So, for the Sling TSI with the Magnum chute, 656 feet AGL is the minimum altitude that the chute manufacturer is willing to guarantee that the chute will work. But, the chute may still save your life from lower than that. So, if you face no survivable options, you might as well pull the chute. Pulling the chute below the minimum demonstrated altitude in a Cirrus is a little disconcerting, because in their system, the airplane initially goes into a sharply nose-down orientation. This is because the aft harness initially begins in the snub position, which is done to reduce the initial impact of the chute deployment. Then, line cutters sever a snub line, allowing the tail to fall down to a more level position, about 10 degrees nose down. With a sling being a lighter airplane, we don't need all that complexity. We don't have the snub lines or line cutters, etc. So the sling settles more quickly into a relatively level attitude. As such, I'd be even less reluctant to pull the chute below the minimum recommended altitude of 656 feet AGL if no other survivable option exists. So, for example, if I took off from an airport with nothing but buildings or dense trees around and my engine quit at 500 feet, I wouldn't hesitate to pull the chute. Yes, it's below the minimum demonstrated altitude, but what choice do I have? I'm too low to pull off a 180 degree turn back and crashing into buildings or dense trees offers a lower chance of survival. So I'll pull the chute. For those of you who have watched my impossible turn video, you may have noticed something. The minimum turn back altitude is pretty darn close to the minimum recommended chute deployment altitude. So if you have an engine failure after takeoff at say 700 feet AGL, would you pull a chute or attempt the turn back? First, let's remember that the minimum turn back altitude varies based on multiple factors, including weight, density altitude, winds, and runway length. But let's say for this hypothetical day, the minimum turn back altitude and the minimum recommended chute deployment altitude are the same, and you lose your engine after takeoff right at that altitude. What would you do? Well, like everything else, that decision could be influenced by a ton of variables. Terrain in the vicinity, airport layout, pilot proficiency, etc. If the airport is in the middle of the plains with tons of flat fields around, I might neither pull the chute nor turn back, instead just land on a field in front of me. If the terrain in the immediate vicinity of the return runway might create a hazard on return, I'd probably opt for the chute. If the airport is just a skinny runway surrounded by trees and buildings, again, I'd probably opt for the chute. If I hadn't practiced turnbacks in a while, and I don't have a significant buffer over the minimum turnback altitude, again, I'd probably opt for the chute. But if I was proficient and the airport had a wide open layout providing a large target with lots of room for error, then I'd probably do the turnback. As I've said before, with all of the confounding factors, it would be difficult to make a snap decision in an emergency, but luckily, we can make this decision on the ground with the parking brake set. Before takeoff, figure your minimum turn back altitude or minimum chute deployment altitude. Even on the ground, since there are so many variables, you're still not gonna come up with an exact number for the turn back, so I'd suggest erring on the conservative side and padding that number a bit. Add the AGL altitude that you came up with to the field elevation so you know what MSL altitude 
to reference on your altimeter. Give yourself a little briefing before takeoff. It might go something like this. Today my decision altitude will be 800 feet AGL. That'll be 1900 feet MSL on my altimeter. Given the flat fields all around this airport, if I have an engine failure below that, I'll land straight ahead. Above that, I'll execute a turn back. Or on a different day at a different airport, it might go something like this. Today my decision altitude will be 800 feet AGL. That'll be 1900 feet MSL on my altimeter. Given the dense trees off of the departure end, if I have an engine failure before that, I'll pull the chute. But given the wide open layout of the airport and my recent proficiency, Above that, I'll execute a turn back. Or, on another day at a different airport, it might go something like this. Given the dense buildings all around the airport and my lack of turn back proficiency, I'll add extra buffer and make my minimum turn back altitude 1,000 feet AGL. That'll be 2,100 MSL on my altimeter. I'll pull the chute for an engine failure below that, and above that, I'll execute a turn back. And look, these takeoff briefings don't have to be this formal or out loud. Just the point is to come up with a plan on the ground before you take off. As the expression goes, proper planning prevents poor performance. For edge cases, when the engine failure occurs right at your decision altitude and there's no good options in front of you, it may be wise to begin to turn back, even if pulling the chute. This follows the philosophy of being prepared for the next what if and sets you up for a possible return in case the chute didn't deploy. Anyway, those are my thoughts on the subject, but none of this is set in stone. There's more than one way to skin a cat, so I'm open to different interpretations and philosophies. If you have different ideas, feel free to let me know what you think in the comments.